Hey guys, it's Taya. Before we get into this message, I wanted to let you know about our up and coming film series, Angelina. This series is about the unraveling of a generational curse and gaining the strength to break it. We will be streaming Angelina on both Woman Evolve TV as well as YouTube, so make sure that you're subscribed because you don't want to miss this story. Here's a sneak peek. Every little girl has dreams. But how many of those turn into nightmares? This is my story, and I'm ready to share it. My name is Angelina. I have a message. I don't know. I don't know what God's going to do in this place. But um, it would be remiss of me to just jump right into my message without taking time to acknowledge my father, the founder of Woman Thou Art Loose, the Grand Bishop, the Honorable, my daddy, my daddy. Um, you know, I've told you how incredibly honored I am that you would trust me with this moment in the final conference. And I was thinking of, to myself, like, what do you say about, you know, your dad? Because, you, you know, I have, to get, I have to say something. I've said things privately, but in this moment, I felt it necessary to say something. And, Dad, I don't know if I ever told you about the role that you have played as far as me as a woman in ministry. You know who you are as my protector. You know who you are as my friend, as my cooking competition. But I think that you should know that as a woman in ministry, I know who you are. I know what you have done to make a way for women in community and spaces where some women are not even allowed to be on the stage. You allowed for women to come and be a part of helping other women. And you have launched ministries and destinies because you said yes, and you allowed yourself to go against the status quo. Daddy, um, you know your father, you know your father. Um, he was a janitor. And he died when you were 15 years old. You talk about this all the time. But when I was thinking about what to say to you, I'm not sure that you realized that you actually followed in your dad's footsteps. Um, he was a janitor. When I was looking at that word janitor, I was looking at it in the etymology of it, and I saw that in the Latin, that janitor actually means doorkeeper. And when I think about who you are and what you have done for women in ministry, some see a giant, some see a bishop, but I see a man who knew how to hold the door open to let as many women through as possible. Can you help me acknowledge the grand doorkeeper, the man who would speak to us and empower us when no one else would? I'm sorry, God, this is the final woman thou art loose. This may be the last time he gets to hear from women just how important his ministry was. This may be the last time he gets to hear how much you liberated us, how much you helped us to walk in confidence, how you helped us to walk in courage. Daddy, take it in, because this is just the portion of your harvest. Generational curses broken, books written, ministry started, women in therapy, women talking back to cancer, women taking place and authority in their marriage. Daddy, you held the door open and we walked through it, and we are now holding the door open for you as you move into the next dimension of what God has for you. You will not go at it alone.
alone. Our prayers will be with you. Our support will be with you. Because we know how to hold the door open because you taught us. It mattered that you preached when your mama was going into the ground. It mattered that you preached when your baby was having a baby. It mattered that you preached when all hell was breaking loose. It mattered to us, Bishop. We took your seed and we gave you harvest. to us. Let's go. Let's go. What's up? Let's go. Yeah. And it must be said, especially now that I am married to a pastor, that I understand, Mom, that you were the first woman that allowed yourself to be seen so that you could be loosed. You let him practice on you in your marriage so that he knew how to speak to us. And mama, I want you to know that you are the best to ever do it. <laughs> and I want you to know that you give us hope and strength and power and grace to believe that loosed is just the beginning, that there is grace and class and power. Even after this, we too are your harvest because your life was the seed that started it all. And we thank you for allowing him to see you and pastor you to nurse you and to see where you didn't have it together and to allow him to minister to you. We thank you that you took it seriously and that you stayed and that you kept showing up, even in pain. Whew. This is a... Uh, this wasn't just a conference for us. This was sacrifice. This was pain. This was criticism. This was faith. This was trust. This was time away from children. This was not just a conference. It wasn't just something to do. My parents believe in you. 
And because they believed in you, they sacrificed everything to get to you for 30 plus years. If they were going to protest it, they'd have to protest with them watching. If they were going to talk about us, they still showed up. And I thank you both for continuing to hold the door open. We're walking through it still. Amen? Amen. That's good. My um, subject tonight is take the wall. I, uh, I love you too, girl. I'm going to cash up you for doing that, just like I promised. I'm a woman of my word. I've been praying all week. First of all, I told God, you know how people get up and they say, I had a message, and then God changed it in the middle of the night. I told God, don't you play me like that. <laughs> Try that with somebody else. I've been studying all week. I woke up this morning. I didn't even want to open my eyes because I'm like, you can't change this word. They're going to get what they get, and they're going to not get upset. But I believe God gave me something that's going to help you. I was praying. I was like, God, please help me sing like candy. If I could sing like candy, Wes, when I get up there, I believe I could shift the atmosphere. And then also, while I'm asking, Lord, if you could give me insight like Sandra Riley, that would also help me to do something. Then, uh, also, if you could teach me how to just hoop like Marissa Farrell, I think I could preach blood pressure up and down. And then I said, Lord, while you're at it, it's since you're just in the given mood, if you could teach me to teach like Priscilla Shire. And if you're not going to give me that, just give me her scalp. Because I don't know what the angels were doing when they made her hair follicles. But they would sleep on my day. I'm, I fight for every edge I got. I said, Lord, just give me the longevity of Bishop Jacqueline McCullough. Let me be consistent and faithful. And I also, I was asking God for a lot of things. I said, give me the finesse of Dr. Anita Phillips because my God how faith and therapy come together in a way that makes you feel empowered. The intellect of Bishop Carolyn Joel, I asked and asked, and he told me when I got finished praying that I wouldn't be humble if he gave me those things. <laughs> so I'm here with my word and this voice God gave me, Joshua 2. Verse 8 through 15. I'm in the New King James Version. I am preaching about Rahab. Yeah. And at this point in the text, I know most of you all are Bible scholars, but I'm going to break it down for those of us who slept a little during Sunday school. That's you. Hey, girl, how you doing? Um, they told me Woman Evolve was in the building. Is the delegation here? We not a sorority, but we think we a gang or something. It's weird. <laughs> yeah. Verse 18 says, now, before they lay down, just let me give you some context. Rahab is a woman living in Jericho, behind the walls of Jericho. And the children of Israel, God's chosen people, have been promised the land that Rahab's people are inhabiting. And they are trying to figure out what is the best way for them to actually get into that land. And so Joshua, who was the leader of that time, sends two spies into Jericho. And he sends those two spies into Jericho to scope out the land to see what angle do we need to take? How are we going to actually take over this land? They get over the wall of Jericho and they end up at the house of Rahab. Rahab is what the Bible calls a harlot, what modern day feminists would call a sex worker. She is a prostitute. And they're in the house of this woman when the king's men hear that there are spies in Jericho. And so she hides them because Rahab has received a word that 
her country's enemies are not her enemies. That um, the people in her culture may be against the children of Israel, but she has actually received a revelation about their God. And so instead of working against them, she wants to work with the spies to help them inhabit the promised land. And so she takes them up to her roof where she's going to hide them. And it says, now before they lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given you the land, that the terror of you has fallen on us. And that all the inhabitants of the land are faint-hearted because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt. And what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were on the other side of the Jordan, Sion and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts melted. Neither did there remain any more courage in anyone because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. Now, therefore, I beg you, swear to me by the Lord, since I have shown you kindness, that you also will show kindness to my father's house and give me a true token and spare my father, my mother, my brothers, my sisters, and all that they have and deliver our lives from death. So the men answered her, our lives for yours, if none of you tell this business of ours, and it shall be when the Lord has given us the land that we will deal kindly and truly with you. Then she let them down by a rope through the window, for her house was on the city wall. She dwelt on the wall. Spirit of the living God, we welcome you. Surely you've already been in this place for decades after decades. And so, God, we just pray that we would tap into the flow, that we would tap into the river that has been loosing women for decades. God, I pray that at this culmination, that you would allow us to have a culmination of everything that has happened to us, that it would finally be reconciled. God, I pray right now for every woman in this room, that there would be no distraction as she receives this word, that there would be no anxiety as she receives this word, that just for a moment she would be completely present. And as she is present in this place. God, I pray that you would speak to her as only you can. Illuminate this word. Allow this word to be made flesh within my own spirit that I may offer to these your sons and daughters a word that they know came straight from heaven. I thank you, God, that it's already done. So we come into agreement with what you've already said, and we say it is so. And so it is. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Um, I just have to take a minute and say that um, when I first met my husband, Pastor Ture, who was in the building over there. Hi, hey, Pastor Ture, how are you? Can you wave at the people? God bless you. Yes. Um, he told me that he was going to create an environment for me to flourish. I didn't know what that meant, but it was the smoothest thing I'd ever heard. <laughs> so I'm signing up for that. <laughs> and here we are, baby. You are a man of your word, and I just want to take a minute and acknowledge you. I thank you for the way that you're covering and praying for me even now. I appreciate you and love you in every way. And while I'm at it, y'all, just give me a minute. Children, can y'all stand up and wave at the people, all, all six of y'all and Ty, who we just got. Come on, we just picked him up in April. How y'all doing? Oh, our oldest daughter got married. Ella must be asleep. That's all right. Is she over? The, she went to the bathroom. You know, during weeks like this, the kids have to share us a lot more than they usually do. And I just want to acknowledge you all and thank you for the sacrifice that you're making so that we can have this moment with these women. I'm going to fry you all kinds of chicken when we get home. <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> In 2020, we celebrated 100 years of the women's suffrage movement. A hundred years since the Women's Voting Act 
being ratified here in the United States. And as I was studying about just the women's suffrage movement, I thought, ignorantly to be honest, that America was at the forefront of making this happen. And I was wrong. I did some more studying and some more digging and I learned that actually New Zealand was the first country that allowed women to vote. Come on, New Zealand, what's up? One of you, hey, one of you from New Zealand in here? There was a woman by the name of Catherine Wilson Shepard, who in 1888 pu published a pamphlet called 10 Reasons Why Women in New Zealand Should Be Allowed to Vote. In 1888, she publishes it, and five years later in 1893, women received the right to vote, five years later. One of the reasons why she gave these 10 reasons, I won't list them all, but one of the reasons she gave was that because women are endowed with a more constant solicitude for the welfare of the rising generations, thus giving them a more far-reaching concern for something beyond the present moment. She knew that when you give woman an access to voting, that she's going to think about more than just herself. She's going to think about the generations connected to her. That's why meetings like this are so powerful, because when women come together, they keep nothing to themselves. I guarantee you in this room, someone has already asked someone where you get those shoes from. <laughs> where do you get your hair done? Because when women find something out, they think about more than just themselves. They pass the information along to others. It would be easy to think that because it happened in New Zealand, that it affected what took place in America. That maybe some way America was inspired by New Zealand giving women the right to vote, but this is not true either. I found it interesting that though in 1848 there was the Women's Convention in Seneca Falls, that it was long before then that women were actually talking about the right to vote. In 1830, there was a black woman, an activist, an abolitionist named Maria Stewart. She's actually the first woman credited with speaking publicly on political issues to a male and female audience, a black woman who didn't know her place. And she was radical. She was so radical that she was advocating for women preachers. She was so radical that she was advocating for women to be able to vote. She was doing this in 1830s. If you look in your history books about the Women's Voting Act, they will credit two women from 1848 for being the people who started the women's voting movement, but that is not true. It started in 1830s with a black woman. Don't worry. In 1831, she would publish an essay, a manifesto. She would speak out. And they would ask her, how are we supposed to actually utilize these rights? How are we supposed to gather the courage to actually activate ourselves in such a way that we can become activists for our own rights? And you know what this radical black woman who was born free, who was actually born to slaves, but was born into freedom just one generation away from being bound, she had a totally different mentality because she had never been enslaved. This radical black woman who had the ability to dream because she had never been restricted told them to possess the spirit of independence. She said, the Americans do, and why should not you? Possess the spirit of men, bold and enterprising, fearless and undaunted. She said, sue for your rights and privileges. You got to remember that we're talking about a woman speaking out in a time where women should not have even been on the platform. And she is empowering women to do something that could very likely get them killed and rejected. And yet she says to do it anyway. She says, know the reason you cannot attain your rights and weary them with your inopportunities. Don't wait until it's convenient for them. Make them weary with you inconveniencing them with you asking advocating for your rights, and she said, you can but die if you make the attempt, and we shall certainly die if you do not. 
I was reading these words, Dad, and I thought to myself, this is so passionate, so inspiring. The things that she was saying now, we would consider radical even now. And yet I realized that her speaking career was only three years long because what we consider passionate now and inspiring now was rejected and dejected then. Isn't it funny how the way time plays out? She abandoned her controversial speaking and decided I'll just be a teacher instead. I'll do something practical because she recognized that she wasn't making headway in the way that she thought that she would. Just because she wasn't able to tear the wall down doesn't mean that she didn't chip at it, though. She wasn't able to bring the radical change that she wanted to see happen because in 1830, they weren't ready to hear it. But in 1848, there were a group of women who were now ready to actually fight for those very rights. She was ahead of her time, or was she? Did she chip at the wall? There are women in this room who feel like breaking a generational curse means I have to see change in my lifetime, not recognizing that sometimes we break a generational curse by just chipping at the wall. We came to a conference because we're chipping at the wall. I'm trying to chip at the wall that divides me from the version of who God says I can be. I'm chipping at the wall of my destiny. I'm chipping at the wall of my identity. And this woman gave up, but she recognized that rejection does not mean disqualification. The revolution does not stop just because I have been rejected. The rejection only repositions me. The rejection only changes the way that I position myself. That means you can break my heart, but you you can't change the way I feel about marriage because rejection does not mean that I am disqualified. It just means I am repositioned. Rejection is an opportunity for me to reposition. It is my way of being able to say it did not work out here, but that does not change my destination. I still have a revolution to start. This woman understood that mentality. So if you are not ready for me at this church, I'll go to a different church where I can start this program. If the bank says it will not happen and in my community, that is okay. I'll fundraise the money on my own. You see, there are some women in this room who have been rejected but not taken out of the game because they saw rejection as an opportunity to reposition. You think I got here because everything went as planned. Absolutely not. Everything actually fell apart and I took those broken pieces and repositioned because at the end of the day, the goal is the goal. The destination is the destination. And even though I may reject it, be rejected, from this path, I accept it as a detour to the next stage. Rejection doesn't stop the revolution. It just repositions it. Women know how to work around walls. When it didn't work out here, Marie just moved around that wall. This isn't a foreign concept for us as women. There are women who have climbed the corporate ladder, not because it was so easy to take one step after another step, but because they worked around the wall to find the ladder in the first place. And they got to one level only to find that the ladder doesn't, ladder doesn't keep extending. You got to work around a different wall. I got to change my language in this place. I got to change the way that I show up in this place. I got to change the way I dress because the ladder is not straight. I have to work around some walls to get it done. I got to work around some walls to raise these children. It wasn't working this way, so I got to work around the wall to get this done. It wasn't working. Don't worry, I'm coming for you. I'm just working around some walls to get there. Don't worry, I'm coming for you. I'm just trying to lay a foundation to help you understand that the reason you are so tired is because you've had to work around some walls to get to destiny. You've had to work around some walls to get to purpose. You've had to work around some walls for you to be who you are. People envy you you, but they don't realize I'm dizzy from working around walls. Every time I make it to one level, a wall shoots up in another direction, and I could stop and I could give up, but for some reason, my mind keeps telling me that I could work around this wall. I may have to take a minute and sit back, but I'm only sitting back so that I can gain the right strategy to see how I work around this wall. I got a wall to work around because I have a destiny that must come forth. I got a 
work around some walls. Destiny looks like a maze sometimes. It's not for those who give up easily. It's for women who don't mind working around some walls. When I was acknowledging Bishop, what I'm really acknowledging is the fact that he knew how to work around some walls. I don't want you in this city. Okay, I'll work around the wall because you're not going to stop me just because you put a wall up in front of me. If God has called me to do something, it doesn't matter how many walls you put up. God must be making a way for me to work around that wall. God must be making a way for me to work around an obstacle. Some of us had to work around walls just to be in this room. No money, but I worked around the wall. Sold out, but I worked around this wall. Told me I shouldn't be in here, but I worked around the wall. Told me they wouldn't help me, but I worked around the wall. Told me they were gonna come with me, fell out at the last minute, but I know how to work around some walls. Faith got shaken. I shouldn't even believe in God anymore, but I know how to work around some walls. Some things happen. I got church hurt and I got trauma, but I'm here because I'm working around some walls. The walls of my shame, the walls of my trauma. I'm working around some walls because I believe what's on the other side of the wall is more important than the thing that's keeping me from destiny in the first place. I'm working around some walls. This isn't foreign for us. We do it in corporate America. We did it to get the right to vote. We've had to do it in some churches that we donated and served and volunteered on, but still couldn't stand on the platform. But we showed up anyway because we don't mind working around some walls. I believe in what God is doing more than I believe in who's doing it sometimes. So I got to work around some walls to be connected to it. But my faith is more important to me. So I work around some walls. No wonder. We are so tired. We've had to work around some walls. When we have to spend so much of our energy and our focus working around the walls outside of us, it is no wonder why we don't have any time to work around the walls within. I don't have time to actually even focus on what's happening inside of me. So I work around those walls too. On one side of the wall, I'm an anointed minister. On the other side of the wall, I'm insecure and afraid. On one side of the wall, I've been called and I believe that I have a purpose. On the other side of the wall, I'm so lonely that I would sacrifice purpose just to be with someone. On one side of the wall, I am a savvy businesswoman. On the other side of the wall, I am one text message away from giving you the title of my car. Give it to you like this. On one side of the wall, I'm Barbara. On the other side of the wall, I'm Shirley. <laughs> On one side of the wall, I'm crime mob, knuck if you buck. On the other side of the wall, I'm Maverick City. I wish I had some women in this room who know that it's about two, three different versions of me. It depends on which side of the wall I'm on. On one side of the wall, I'm anointed. On the other side, I'm an alcoholic. On one side of the wall, I have it all together. On the other side of the wall, I'm losing my mind. On one side of the wall, I'm brilliant. On the other side of the wall, if you just look at me a certain way, I'll give you everything I have. I'm working around the walls that are happening inside of me. On one side of the wall, I climb the ladder. On the other side of the wall, I'm depressed. On one side of the wall, I'm the one everyone comes to. On the other side of the wall, I hate myself. On one side of the wall, I am the encourager. On the other side of the wall, I wish that some Somebody would actually encourage me. I'm working around walls to show up in this room. It hasn't always been easy for me, but I worked around some walls to show up. On one side of the wall, I'm the person that everyone can count on. On the other side of the wall, I'm a 13-year-old girl with trauma down on the inside of me. On one side of the wall, I'm this. On the other side of the wall, I'm that. And the only way that I can show up and smile for everyone is if I learn to work around the walls instead of confronting the walls. working around 
some walls, the walls within, the walls outside. These gender archetypes make us feel like the only way that we can show up is if we act like we're the good girls who got it all right. We don't give ourselves permission to be complex and complicated because we're afraid that if I let the fullness of who I am out, if someone really understood what was on both sides of the wall, then they wouldn't stay. And so I try to fit into this role. I try to show up in this way that will make everyone happy and acceptable. But the truth is, I'm working around some walls. Back behind this wall, there are some things that I'm not sure anyone could connect with. And yet the truth is that God did not call us to work around walls. God did not call us to play this archetype or this stereotype of who we think we should be. God called us to do one thing in Genesis 1, and that is the one thing that we have failed to do because we're so busy trying to be nice, and we're so busy trying to not be bossy, and we're so busy trying to make sure that we don't ruffle feathers, and we're so busy trying to make sure we're beautiful but not distracting because we don't want the men to feel a certain way. We're trying to make sure we stay humble and confident. We're trying to play a role, but the truth is that God said that when he blessed them, he gave them dominion over the sea. He gave them the opportunity to be fruitful and multiply and to fill the earth. God didn't tell you to play little miss good girl. God told you to walk around like the boss he created you to be. I gave you dominion. I gave you power. I gave you the opportunity to subdue something. And if you start acting like the little miss good girl who's not complicated, who doesn't have issues, you're going to divide your power and you're going to need all of your power to fulfill who God called you to be and so yes I am complicated and yes I am complex but I am also called I am also anointed and yes I went through this but I still got that in front of me and yes I still got issues but I also still got breakthrough and yes I'm still a mess in this area but I figured it out on this area I'm a work in progress and I know who's working on me so I am done trying trying to play cute, and I am done trying to be accepted. I'm ready to be anointed for real. I am done trying to make sure that I'm the perfect little lady so some man can pick me up. I want to be the perfect little image of God walking on the earth. I want to be the perfect little image of who God has created me to be. I don't want to be who you need me to be. I want to be who God called me to be, and I'm going to have to take the wall down to get it done. I'm going to have to tear some things up to get it done. God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Not just to him, he said it to them. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves. So we got to be willing to ask ourselves what happened between God's original intention and where we have landed. Genesis 3 has the answer. We've already talked so much about Eve and the curse and what happened when she ate from the fruit. But what we fail to realize is when she did that, a wall went up that separated us from God. A wall went up that changed the way we engage with God. A wall went up that changed the way we see the mirror. We were made in the image of God and we used to be able to see God, but when Eve ate from the fruit, a wall went up and now I can no longer see the very image I am seeking to pursue, a wall went up. And when that wall went up between us and God, a wall also went up within her. A wall of shame, a wall of second guessing, a wall of trying and never actually being. And so when we see what God says in Genesis 3 and 15, we recognize that it is not just us who know how to work around walls. Genesis 3.15 is when God gives the promise to the serpent 
that though you have backed Eve up against the wall, that I know how to work around walls as well. Genesis 3 and 15 is when we recognize that God says, I'm going to put enmity between you and the woman because you backed her up against the wall, between your seed and her seed because you backed her up against the wall, and he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. What happened? Somewhere along the way, it went from him talking about the woman and the serpent and all of a sudden a he is inserted, that he is a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ, that he is the guarantee that God will work around the wall, that he is us promising, is God promising us that when it's all said and done, you may have backed her up against the wall, but I'm going to make a way of escape. I don't know about you, but I could take about 10 seconds right now and thank God that he knows how to work around walls. I could take about 10 seconds right now and thank God that when my back was up against the wall, I'm not talking about something that someone did to me. I'm talking about I backed myself up against the wall, that God made a way out of no way because God works around walls. How is it that you were in this room? Lest God made a way. There was no way that I should have got out of that mess, but some kind of way God worked me against that wall. He worked me out of that situation. He worked me out of that trap. The enemy thought he had Eve trapped, but little did she know that God had already made an escape. I want to prophesy to somebody who feels trapped in this room. I want to prophesy to somebody whose back is against the wall, and I'm here because I'm trying to figure out how in the world am I going to get out of this mess? How in the world am I going to save this marriage? How in the world am I going to help this child? And you've been feeling like your back is against the wall. I want you to know that you came to Atlanta, Georgia, so that God could remind you that I know how to work around walls. I know how to get you out of that trap. I know how to make a way out of no way. I know how to create an escape where it looked like there was none. You looking at the wall, God says, I'll drop a rope for you to climb over. You looking at the wall, but God says, there's a trap door up underneath you. You looking at the wall, but God says, I got a million ways to do it. I got a million ways to find you. I got a million ways to save you. I got a million ways to get that baby. I got a million ways to save that marriage. I got a million ways to get you out of that mess. I got a million ways to finance that business. A million ways to publish that book. You think it came from one source, so you mad because you backed against the wall. God says that one source was nothing compared to me. Your back being against the wall only scares you and doesn't change anything about who God is. God says, I can get you out of this. Oh God, you don't have the resources. Your back is against the wall. But I hear God saying, don't give up yet. Don't quit yet. Don't faint yet. Don't throw in the towel yet. Don't you dare walk away. Don't you dare put the dream away. Don't you dare think it can't be done. I came to raise somebody's faith in this room. I need somebody to understand that man may not support it, that your history may not back it up, but if the breath of God gets behind you, there is nothing. I'll blow the wall out the way. I'll push the I'll kick the wall down. I'll destroy everything that's standing in the way of who I've called you to be. Do you know you serve a wall breaker? You call him a chain breaker. I call him a wall breaker. A wall breaker. A wall breaking night, a wall breaking night. I heard God say, before your head hits the pillow, I'ma break a wall. Before you get in the car, I'ma break a wall. Before you step out of this room, I'ma break a wall. Break it, break it. You better be careful who you're sitting next to. You might get dust on you. 
because you sit next to a woman who might help God break a wall. You won't have to do it without me. I'm gonna make sure that while you working on one side of the wall, I'm gonna be praying on the other side of the wall. While you pushing, I'm gonna kick. While you working it out, God, I'm gonna work it out on my side. I'm gonna let my praise be a weapon. I'm gonna let my worship be a weapon. A wrecking ball. I heard God say, you sit next to a wrecking ball. You sit next to a woman who had to break through some things to get to where she is. You sit next to a woman who had to work around some walls. And when she got tired, she just started chipping away at that bad boy. Break it, break it. God, break the notes. I prayed God, when we came into this room, that he would break the wall between heaven and earth, that somebody would have a divine encounter with God that would fuel them in a way they haven't been fueled in a long time, that would change them in the depths of their being. I said, God, break the wall between heaven and earth so that a daughter can get back in position, so that a daughter can feel her power again. Let's talk about it. Rahab lives on the wall. Rahab lives on the wall. When God gave me this message, he didn't tell me what to say. He just kept saying something about being on the wall, on the wall, on the wall, on the wall on the wall, I didn't understand it. God, what are you talking about? He just kept saying, you gotta study the fact that Rahab was on the wall. So I start studying Rahab. And I thought to myself when I was studying, maybe Rahab lives on the wall because she was a sex worker and she was the outcast of society. And maybe life had pushed her until her back was against the wall. But I realized that I was studying her life from a westernized lens that I was projecting our thoughts and philosophies about sex work onto Rahab. Y'all be all right, that ain't the first time you heard sex. Everybody gonna make it. Everybody gonna make it, I promise you. So I started studying Canaanite religion and what it meant to be a prostitute in the Canaanite religion. And I stumbled across something that I've never heard preached before. I'm not saying I discovered it, I just never heard this before. And what I learned is that in Canaanite religion, a prostitute was sacred. It was sacred prostitution because they had multiple gods. I'm gonna break it down for you. And there was Baal and Asheroth. And in this religion, they attributed it, the fertility of the land to the fact that they had gods who, reckon, who, were, who represented fertility. 
So the prostitution became sacred because Rahab would stand in proxy of the female god Asheroth. And the male priest would stand in proxy for the god Baal. And they would engage in sacred prostitution in an effort to get the gods to join together. They thought that that's what made the land fertile. Oh no, I studied for woman thou art loosed. So Rahab stands in proxy of God for her people. You stand in proxy as God for your people. And that's why you're trained. And that's why you're tired. We want to have faith like Rahab, but the truth is for most of us, we are more Rahab than we realize because we don't know how to say no, because we don't know how to let go. And so here we are imitating being like God instead of leading them to God. Now suddenly I realize why of all people God chose Rahab to be the one who lived on the wall for the spies. Because Rahab has intimate knowledge of how powerless what they have faith in is. So when she starts hearing that there is a God who has stopped the Red Sea, and she starts hearing about a one God who could overthrow their contemporaries who believed in the same God. She starts recognizing that she's got to lose faith in what she thought had power so that she could actually tap into real power. I want to talk to somebody in this room who is losing faith in what they thought had power. And you're wondering what's wrong. And you're wondering what's happening in your soul. And I want you to know until you lose faith in what you thought had power, you're never going to get connected to the thing that has real power. I know you wanted the job and you've lost faith in your ability to get the job. But I hear God saying the job never had any power to begin with, that you had too much faith in the relationship. You had too much faith in the job, in the business, in the children. She's losing faith in what she thought had power. And so Rahab does what you're going to have to do. When she welcomes the spies into her house, she recognizes that she's not just welcoming in spies. She's welcoming destruction. She has to welcome in destruction because she recognizes if I don't let destruction in, then things might stay the way they've always been. But until I decide that I can handle destruction, then I may not get the breakthrough I'm looking for. I wanna talk to somebody who's trying to keep their life from falling apart. I wanna talk to somebody who's trying to resist destruction. And I wanna let you know that the mandate God gave me for you is that you are gonna to have to become like Rahab and and begin welcoming destruction because the Bible says in Hebrews 12 that we can let everything that can be shaken be shaken so that that which cannot be shaken can remain. If you don't start welcoming destruction, you may never see who your friends are. If you don't welcome destruction, you may never see where your anointing is. If you don't welcome destruction, you may stay in a relationship that's less than you. If you don't welcome destruction, you may they never birth the business. If you don't welcome destruction, you may keep that wall up when God is calling it to come down. You want to know why demons tremble? Demons tremble when walls come down. Demons tremble when a woman get crazy enough to say if it can be shaken, it was not for me. Though he slay me, yet shall I trust in him. I welcome destruction because it'll only make me better. I'm crazy enough to believe that all things are working together for my good. I welcome it. 
I welcome it, I welcome it, I welcome it, I welcome it. Break my heart so it can be healed for real this time. Break the marriage so it can be restored this time. If you not on it, I don't want it. If you left me because I got anointed, baby, you was never for me. If you left me because I started the business, baby, you was gonna be borrowing money. God did me a favor when you walked out of my life. God did me a favor when he brought that trauma up in my spirit because now I get to break the wall down, change the generational curse, change the way your family does things. I'm going to welcome destruction and you're not going to like me. You may not like me for a season. I may not be who you're used to. I may not look like what you're used to. But I'm telling you, it's only because I've welcomed destruction. I've welcomed God into my life in such a way where I say, God, you don't have to build it up. God, I want you to tear it down. I wish I had about one or two crazy women who would stop praying, God, build it, and start praying, God, break it. God, break it. God, destroy it. God, take this insecurity and destruct it. God, take this journey. Is it you in the back? Who's welcoming destruction? Is it you over there? Who's welcoming destruction? All hell's not breaking loose. All hell's not breaking loose. It's just the walls are coming down. You're not losing yourself. It's just the walls are coming down. You're not giving up too fast. It's just the walls are coming down. I lost faith in what didn't have power so I could gain faith in what really matters. No, I don't really care about the career anymore. I care about having my whole mind. I care about having my whole heart. I care about having, I'm crazy enough to believe that if I seek the kingdom, all other things will be added unto me. I'm gonna look a little different after this because I welcome some destruction. God changed my mind. God changed my thoughts. God healed my heart. God tear it down. Destruct the words that my mama said. Tear down the walls that my daddy built. Tear down the words that they gave me when they abandoned me. Break it, Jesus. In the name of Jesus, I decree and declare wherever there is a wall that has kept you from being who God has called you to be, that it will be destroyed not when you leave, not when you get home. God, destroy it right now in the name, in the name of Jesus, the name that makes demons tremble, the name that makes hell nervous. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, strongholds. That word strongholds translates from a word that means fortified, like a fortified castle. And I don't mean the castles we've been watching on TV the last few weeks. Castles in this day were made by stone and walls. So when we say the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, what we're really talking about is it's pulling down the walls that have kept us from being us.
And it's not going to happen through being carnal. It's only going to happen if I see this as a spiritual assignment. I got a weapon for that wall. God did not leave you without a weapon for that wall. That wall of insecurity, that wall of rejection, that wall of abandonment. You've been working around a wall that God wants to pull down. And God says, I'm going to give you strategy to do it. You're not going to think your way out of it. I'm going to give you strategy to do it. You're not going to perform your way out of it. I'm going to give you strategy to do it. It's not going to be something that you need a mentor for. You're not going to need the family restored to do it. You're not going to need a man to get it done. I'm going to give you a weapon that man cannot get you. I'm going to give you a weapon that can only come from God. So you think you've been praying a useless prayer. And I hear God saying that every time you open up your mouth and pray, every time you open up your mouth and worship, that I'm giving you artillery. I don't know who you are, but I hear God saying that you got more weapons than you think. You're just afraid to use them because you think the walls are greater than your weapon. But I hear God saying faith without works is dead. If you would take that weapon and believe that I anointed it. I will point you in the direction of the generational curse that has your name on it and you will release a sound that you did not even know was with you. You will release a sound that no one in your family has ever released. You will release a vision that the earth has not seen. God's going to whisper sweet nothings in your ear and when you decree what he said, Something's got to break. Something's got to break. Something's got to break. You better release it with faith and believe that when you release it, something's got to break. I'm releasing it over my child, so I'm not going to worry any longer because something's got to break. It don't have to break tomorrow, but because I decree it, I know it's going to break. Because I believe it, I know it's going to break. I got faith for the breakthrough. I got faith for what God said. He's already going to do. You're looking at somebody who preached when their life was falling apart because I believe that when I got finished preaching that something was going to be breaking. I hear the sound of something breaking in the spirit realm. I hear the sound of something breaking in your spirit. I hear the sound of hell backing up off of you. Oh God. Oh God. Oh God, oh God, I call on your name. The name that is above every other name. I call you Chira. I hear cancer breaking. I hear depression breaking. I hear suicidal thoughts breaking. Holy Spirit, have your way, not in this room, but in her heart. Holy Spirit, have your way, great God that you are. Surely you are the God who knows how to work around walls, but I present to you a woman who doesn't want you to have to work around walls any longer. I present to you a woman who wants the walls tore down. I present to you a woman who came to Atlanta, Georgia, because she's that urgent, she's that serious, she's that demanding, she is that bossy about a wall coming down in her life. When Rahab welcomes destruction, she's welcoming. She doesn't know it. She doesn't know how Israel's going to invade Jericho. She doesn't know how they're going to take over the promised land. 
She doesn't know that in this moment, she has welcomed them to take the wall down. Now it makes sense to me why God positioned her where he positioned her. He needed a woman whose back was against the wall because he was going to tear the wall down. And he needed a woman who had lost faith in something that had no power so that she would be desperate enough to welcome destruction. Do you know how much courage it takes to welcome destruction? To welcome radical change. God, I don't want it to change. I don't want to say goodbye. I don't want to bury this person, God. I don't want to move, God. I don't want to walk like this, God. I don't want to talk like this, but God, you put me in it, and I don't want to keep fighting against the very thing that you're trying to do. So, God, I don't know why you've got me against this wall, but I'm going to welcome whatever destruction is connected to it because I'm crazy enough to believe that you have me against the wall because you'll tear the wall down. You want to come to woman thou art loosed. The loosing only happens when the walls come down. Loose to be still walled up doesn't make any sense. You can be free in a room with nothing but walls. So am I really free? If I still have a limit on what I believe God can do in my life, am I really free? If I still believe that that's only reserved for the ones who did things the right way, am I really free? If I believe that I'm damaged goods, am I really free? If I don't believe I can be healed, am I really free? I'm loose, but am I free? Rahab could have got the revelation and just let things go however they were going to go. But she decided to be a participant in helping God establish something new. Family, I'm finished. But just for a moment, I want to tell you that the reason why I am so confident and your ability to take the wall down is because I recognize what Jesus did on the cross. That yes, Eve messed it up in the garden, but Jesus fixed it on the cross. Jesus fixed it on the cross. He restored the connection that we can have with God through the Holy Spirit when he was nailed to the cross 2,000 years ago. The Bible says that they knew it was finished because the veil in the temple, which was thick as a wall, was ripped open. When he took the wall down, he gave all of us access to the holies of holies, the most holy place. Because his one mission was to establish a new covenant that would never separate you from the power that you need to take down the walls that the enemy has placed in your life. I want to talk to your disbelief for a minute. I want to talk to your ego for a minute that won't let you tell anyone that you need them and you're suffering on the inside because you won't let anybody in. I want to talk about the walls that you built because you thought you were protecting yourself, but now you don't even know who you are and no one can access you any longer. I want to talk about the walls that we build to protect ourselves. And I want to give you an opportunity 
to serve notice on restriction. That this final woman thou art loosed is going to be about you finally taking that wall down. To live with vulnerability, but to be fully seen. To allow yourself, do you know what's crazy? I'm, I'm finished, I promise. What's crazy about Rahab welcoming destruction is that on one side of the wall, she is a goddess in her community. On the other side of the wall, she's considered an adulteress and a fornicator. In order for her to take the wall down, she was going to have to be willing to live in spaces where people didn't understand her. She was going to have to be willing to live in a space where people didn't understand and where she came from. But she was so desperate to get on the other side of that wall that she did not allow her ego to keep her from breakthrough. She didn't allow her desire to be understood to keep her from breakthrough. I'll be with the foreign people if it means that I can be connected with God. I'll be in a foreign city if it means that I can be connected with God. I'll be by myself if it means I can be connected with God. I'll come to Atlanta if it means I can be connected with God. Nobody in my family had faith. I'm in a foreign place, in a foreign community, but I'm on the other side of the wall. I want to give you 10 seconds to celebrate the fact that you've already broken down some walls. I want to give you 10 seconds to celebrate that you've already decided to live in breakthrough. And I want you to hear your sister having victory. Because there's a woman that has breakthrough in an area where you need to kick a wall down. And when she releases her sound, she's giving you keys on how to unlock yourself. When she releases her sound, she's building your faith up. The spirit knows who needs to say what. You sitting next to a woman who has already got victory in the place you need it the most. Do me a favor and grab, grab the hand of the woman next to you. I want you to squeeze faith in that woman's hand. I want you to squeeze power in that woman's hand. I want that woman to see that when we link arms together, that we are not just an army, but we are a rope that God can use to help her overcome that wall that when we lock arms together in this way, that we draw strength from one another. I don't know where you're headed. I don't know where you're from. I don't know what wall is waiting on you when you leave this place. But one thing I know for sure is that I'm gonna hold down my square and I'm gonna count on you to hold down yours. And I know I'm gonna see you cause you gonna knock down your wall and I'm gonna knock down my wall. And we're gonna stare at each other and say, look what what the Lord has done. I wasn't supposed to be here and you were not supposed to make it, but my God, 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 my God did something that helped us make it to the other side. Throw her arms up so she knows what it feels like to do a victory lap. Throw her arms up so she knows what it feels like to be on the winning team. My God, throw her arms up so she know what it feels like when a real one got her back. Throw her arms up. Woman. Thou art loose, woman. Thou art loose. Tell a woman, thou art loose. Woman, go be who God's called you to be. Go take down every devil. This is a movement. This thing could never be over. Not as long as you in it. Every woman who has an encounter with you will have an encounter with God and she will be loose 
and she will be set free because of what God did on the inside of you. depression, loosed over anxiety, loosed over oppression, loosed over depression, loosed over trauma, loosed to be who God has called you to be, loosed to walk with authority, loosed to walk in power, loosed to run up on a devil and tell the devil I wish you would, loosed to tread on the head of serpent. Tore the wall down. 